Hey, how you doing? I'm Elton, and this is a 101 for Windows containers and Docker. If you've heard the news that Docker runs natively on Windows 10 and Windows Server 2016, but all you know about Docker is that they have a cool logo, then this is the walkthrough for you. I'll show you what Docker is, how to use it with Windows, and why it's such an important technology. And it's a great technology. Docker can improve pretty much every aspect of delivering and running software. First up, here's the background. Docker is an application packaging technology. You use it to create a single package which bundles up your entire application. So you can Dockerize an ASP.NET website, and what you do is you build one package which has your web application with all its dependencies, plus the platform, so that's .NET, with all its dependencies, plus the host, so that's IIS, plus the operating system, and it's all in one package. Docker calls that package an image, and when you've packaged your ASP.NET app as an image, you can run it on any Windows machine that has Docker installed. You run the image in a container, which is an isolated environment on the machine. The Windows box you run the container on doesn't need IIS installed, or .NET, or anything except Docker. Everything that your app needs, including all its configuration, that's all baked into the image. So wherever you run it, it will run in the same way. We'll see how that looks for an ASP.NET app shortly, but we'll start with something simple. You build a Docker image by creating a text file called a Docker file, where you specify all the instructions to set up your application. This is a command line world. Containers don't have a UI, so if your PowerShell isn't too hot, it soon will be. The Docker file is the source code for your image, but the syntax is really simple. You only need to know half a dozen instructions to build production grade images. This Docker file just has three instructions. From is mandatory. It says which image we're going to use as the basis for our new image. This is like saying which operating system you want to start with. I'm using Microsoft Nano Server, and this line will give me a clean install of Nano Server to use as the basis for my application image. Next, I'm going to copy a file from my local machine into the Docker image. So this is how you would copy your compiled application, or your scripts, or whatever else your app needs to run. In this case, it's just one file, which is a simple PowerShell script that prints out environment variables. The last instruction is the command. This tells Docker what to do when you run a container from the image. So here, we're just going to execute that PowerShell script. The Docker file is the source, and I build it into an image with the docker build command. Every image needs a tag, which is effectively the image name, and I need to tell docker where to find the docker file and the content for the image. That's any resources that you use in the docker file, like my PowerShell script. I can just use dot if it's all in the current directory. If this is the first image you build, Docker will see that you don't have the Microsoft Nano Server image and it will download it from the Docker Hub, which is a public shared store for images. I already have the base image locally, so Docker will just run through each instruction in the Docker file and the final output is a new image with the name that I gave it. The Docker images command lists all the images on your machine and here's the new one that I've just built. The image is just the application package, remember, there's nothing running yet, all I've done is to bundle up my application. To run it, I use the docker run command, giving the name of the image, and what docker will do is create a container for my app from the image. That's an isolated sandbox where the application runs. Here's the output from my script, and we can see a bunch of environment variables. The operating system is Windows NT, and the host name starts with B9B. If I repeat that command, I'll get a new host name written out. This time it's D53, because Docker creates a new container for every run. Inside the container, the app thinks it's running in its own machine, with its own host name and IP address. But on the host, containers are lightweight and disposable units of compute. OK, so we ran some containers that only did one thing, writing out some content. So what happened to them when the PowerShell command finished? Docker PS lists all the running containers, and there aren't any. Those containers ran and then exited. I can see them in the exited status when I run Docker PS all. 
Docker monitors the process that it starts when it runs a container, which was the PowerShell script in this case. When the process ends, then the container exits. We've seen how to build a Docker file into a simple image and run a container from the image. My image just copies one PowerShell script on top of the nano server base image and configures Docker to run the script when you start a container. This is a task container, which just does one thing and then exits, and it's a really useful pattern. My container executes a trivial script, but it could do anything. I could build an image which has scripts to create a whole cloud infrastructure. So when you run the container, it spins up an Azure resource group, virtual network, storage accounts, VMs, everything that you need. And the smart thing is, in that image, you'd have all the PowerShell modules you need, as well as your own scripts. And you can pass variables to the container when you run it, so you've got a complete package for creating a new environment. And anyone can use it. You don't need the right version of PowerShell or the Azure RM modules installed, you just need Docker. Task containers are great for automation because the image has everything it needs. There are no additional steps or hidden dependencies. Docker is a command line tool with a REST API behind it, so it integrates easily with other tools like build servers and even the Windows task scheduler. You could run containers to set up and tear down environments, back up databases, send out mail shots, anything that you want to automate. And there are two other ways to run containers. Let's look at interactive and background containers. My printenv image is built to do just one thing, but I can use it in different ways. Instead of just running it as a task container, I can use the interactive options to connect to a new container, and I can pass a different command to run when it starts. This is the same image running as an interactive container, and I'm connected to a PowerShell session running inside the container. This new container has been created from the same image, so my environment script is here, but it didn't execute when the container started because I told Docker to run PowerShell instead, and that overrides the command that's in the Docker file. I can use an interactive container just like a remote machine or a VM. I can run ping, and we see the container is connected to the outside world. An IP config shows me that the container has its own IP address. In here, I can do anything that the OS lets me do. This is nano server, which is quite restricted, so I can't install MSIs, but I can check on the Windows services that are running, and I could install optional features like DNS. Interactive containers are great for navigating around to see what an image can do, or if you want to test out the steps for a Docker file when you're building up your own image. When I exit PowerShell, that's the end of the process which Docker started, so that container exits, and there's nothing here in the Docker PS output. The terminal colors get a bit mixed up between the sessions, but that's a minor thing. The last way to run a container is the one you'll use most, the background container. Again, I can use the same image. There's nothing special about an image that means it has to be used in a certain way. This time, I'll use the detached option. So Docker will put this container in the background. So now when I run Docker PS, ah, it's not there, which is right. Even though it's a background container, when the process inside it finishes, the container still exits. This container will have run the environment script and then exited. If you want to keep a container running in the background, then you need to keep the process inside the container running too. So we'll do this instead. The same command to run a detached container from the same image, but when it starts, I'll have it ping my local server a hundred times. When the container starts, I get control back in the terminal, and Docker PS shows me the container is running in the background. I won't cover all the Docker commands here, but Docker logs is a good one. It shows me what's being logged by a container, and in this case, that's all my ping results. This isn't an endless process though, like a web server, so when we reach the 100th ping, this container will exit too. We've seen how to build an image and how to run it in different ways, as a task container, which does one thing and stops, as an interactive container, which you connect to like a remote machine, and a background container, which keeps an app running like a Windows service. They're all useful for different scenarios, and how they run depends on how you start the container. The same image can be used in different ways. I'm going to focus on background containers now, because that's where a lot of the value comes from using Docker. 
Let's say you're running some websites and some REST APIs built with .NET. You could package up each of those apps into its own image and run them as Docker containers. But if you do that, what benefit is it going to give you? When you start getting into Docker and running your apps as containers, you'll find it's a technology that removes some of the big problems we have in the software industry. Using pre-configured images makes your delivery process faster and more reliable, so you can release more often and get new features and fixes out more quickly. Docker can change your whole approach. The deployment for your app becomes defined in the Docker file, which is part of your source code, and that brings the operations side closer to the dev side, and that can help you move towards DevOps. Docker images can run on any platform with a matching operating system. So if you're looking at cloud, but you don't want to commit to one vendor, Docker gives you platform independence. You can run your Docker container on AWS or Azure or in your data center or on your laptop, and it will be the exact same application no matter where you run it. And Docker has a whole host of features that support container orchestration. So you can run distributed systems where each part is in its own container. And Docker takes care of the communication between containers and between containers and the outside world. And that makes it easy to start breaking down monolithic apps into microservices. Even if those trends are way down the line for you, there's practical value in using Docker right now. One of the biggest benefits is increased efficiency. You can run a lot of containers on one machine and they're all isolated from each other. Containers don't need allocated resources. The processes inside each container run as if they were running on the host. You don't give a share of CPU and memory to each container, they just use what they need, although you can put maximum limits on what each container can have. You can easily run dozens of apps in containers on a modest server. They could be ASP.NET applications, or .NET Core, or Go, Node, Python, whatever platform is best for solving the problem. They can all happily run on the same host because they're isolated from each other, but they can communicate through Docker's network layer. As long as your containers aren't all hitting peak load at the same time, you can run a lot of apps on one host. And when you eventually do run out of CPU or RAM, you can join several servers running Docker into a swarm. But that's for another session. We're nearly done, but we'll finish up with some more realistic apps in action. This Docker file is for a very simple ASP.NET Core web app, which calculates Pi. We have a familiar set of instructions. I'm starting from Microsoft's .NET Core base image running on Windows Nano Server. The expose instruction is like a simple firewall rule for the image. It's saying that the host can integrate with the container using TCP on port 5000. Then I set the working directory and copy in the compiled .NET Core app from my machine into the image. And then the command instruction just starts the ASP.NET Core application listening on port 5000 on any IP address in the container. I've already built this image and shared it on the public hub. I'll start the web app in the background with docker run d and publish port 5000 in the container to the same port on the host. That means when the host gets a request on port 5000, it will forward it to the container. I'll give the container a name so I can refer to it later, and the image is called 6 eyed Pi Web App Nano Server. This will start in a couple of seconds. Docker PS tells me it's running, and I can browse to localhost port 5000 and see my awesome Pi calculator. Except that I don't, and this is a gotcha that you need to know about. There's a limitation with the networking stack in Windows, which means if I'm logged into the host machine, I can't access the port that's mapped from the container. Docker inspect tells me the IP address of the container, so if I browse to that on port 5000, then I see my awesome Pi app. If this machine gets an external request on port 5000, then it will be routed to the container and work as expected. But when I'm logged onto the host, I can't use local host. So be aware. It's only really a limitation when you're developing locally, but hopefully it will disappear with a future update. So anyway, this is pi to six decimal places, and I can change that with a query string to see 1000 dp. The calcs are all running in .NET Core on Windows Nano Server inside my Windows container. If I want to run another copy of the same app, I can do that. 
I need to publish to a different port because host can't share ports between apps, so I can publish on port 5001. I need to get the container's IP address again because I'm logged on to the host, but I browse to that and it's the same app on the same host, but it's running in a completely independent container, which is a great way to run multiple non-production environments on one machine. Even better, and this is the big finale, I can run existing full ASP.NET applications as Docker containers too. I have a blog series in progress where I'm dockerizing Nerd Dinner, which is the old ASP.NET MVC showcase app from Microsoft. It was last changed on Codeplex in 2013, so it's kind of a legacy app. The Docker file for this is a bit more involved because the app runs in IIS and it uses SQL Server Local DB, so there's a bunch of installations and configuration, but it's configuration we only do once to build the image. And ultimately, this is a tiny amount of work to be able to package up a three-year-old app and run it in Docker. The docker run command is the same. I'll publish port 8081, which the image exposes, and the image from the first post in the series is called Six-Eyed Nerd Dinner Part 1. This image is also on the hub, so you can run this yourself. It's a 4GB download though, so it will take a while the first time, unless you already have the Microsoft IIS base image locally. And it takes a little longer to start because the IIS Windows service starts when the container runs. But here it's running, so I'll get the container's IP address and browse to it. And I see the Nerd Dinner app. So this is the legacy ASP.NET application with no code changes running on Docker. On my Windows 10 machine now, I have two ASP.NET Core apps running in Nano Server containers and a full ASP.NET app running in a Windows Server Core container. They're isolated and I haven't started any limits so they can use as much CPU and RAM as they need. Okay, that's it for the 101, so let's recap. Docker is a technology for packaging a whole application into a single image, which has everything that the app needs. You run the app in a container, which is an isolated environment created from the image. You can dockerize new apps and old apps, and you can run as many containers on your machine as it can handle. Containers don't use much compute resource unless they're doing something. With Windows 10 and Windows Server 2016, you can package Windows apps and run them using Docker natively. At the moment, you can only run Windows containers on Windows and Linux containers on Linux, so be aware of that. But if you want to mix and match applications from different platforms, you can join Windows and Linux machines into one Docker Swarm and use it as a cross-platform compute cluster. We had a quick look at the Docker file, which is the source code for packaging an application, and we saw how to build that into an image and how to run containers in different ways to achieve different goals. Docker has been massively popular in the Linux world because it's a great technology that's easy to get started with and it helps remove a lot of technical problems that we have so you can focus on business problems and deliver more value more quickly. So what's next? On Twitter you can follow the Docker Captains. That's Docker's recognition program like Microsoft have MVPs. The captains are always blogging and they speak regularly at events around the world and they're a great source of information. The documentation on Docker's website and on MSDN is excellent and there are a bunch of sample Windows container images on GitHub that you can use for inspiration. You should follow me on Twitter, obviously, and check out my blog or my GitHub repo to see what I'm doing with my Dockerized Nerd Dinner project. I have a roadmap for taking it from a monolithic ASP.NET app to a distributed system where the most valuable parts are small, easily changed microservices that all run in containers. And finally, one of the reasons Docker got so popular so quickly is because it has a great technical community. Check out meetup.com, there's almost certainly a Docker user group near you. They'll have regular sessions with great talks. The ones I've been to have been super friendly and very welcoming for newcomers. If you're in the UK, I'll probably see you sometime at Docker London. Until then, I'll be putting more videos like this up on YouTube to help you on your journey with Windows and Docker.